Werewolves weren't invented by Hollywood, but Hollywood did have a lot of influence on them. There's a bunch of debatable origins for the myth, some are as old as Hellenistic Greece, and some might even be older and I just haven't heard of them. But most of the tropes that we associate with werewolves, the silver bullet, the transmissible bite, the transforming under the full moon, these are products of horror cinema, they're Hollywood inventions coming from things like Werewolf in London and The Wolfman. And these films would go on to influence the genre in major ways, they're basically early slasher films, so it makes sense that a company who are trying to make interactive horror films would eventually have to touch werewolves, they're just too prominent in the genre. But what's interesting about The Quarry is it wasn't really meant to be a werewolf game from everything I've read, it seems like they kind of stumbled into it, which makes it an interesting project born of limitations, and by limitations I mean executives burned the bridges with Sony, so they couldn't make Until Dawn 2, and with the assets they had it made sense to do a werewolf game. Supermassive games have this constant internal problem, I've known about it since I was approached by them about a job there way back when when I had a real job and a cursory search on the internet returned results like this. Right now they're currently laying off staff so Supermassive are no stranger to troubled development cycles. So now The Quarry's in a weird place, it has to stand on its own two legs as a title, but it's also a spiritual successor to Until Dawn, it's also not part of the Dark Pictures anthology, so it can't really fly under the radar as just being another flop in a mixed series. No, this has to measure up to one of the greatest lightning in a bottle moments in gaming, as I've already talked about numerous times, and it doesn't really measure up. That's not to say The Quarry is bad, I enjoyed my first time with it, and my second time with it I didn't like it as much, but hey that's true of most things, right? I don't think it's an unenjoyable game, it just seems like in 8 years of learning and troubled development cycles, Supermassive have taken one step forward and two steps back. In some ways it's better than Until Dawn, the game it's always going to be compared to, but in many many more ways it's worse, so let's talk about why that is. But before we do any of that, I'm Ratatatatatat, and if at any point you find yourself enjoying the video, click all of the buttons below, especially the big red one, and maybe not the thumbs down one, but I'm not your dad, I can't tell you what to do. So now I'm going to recap the plot, um, you can skip to the timestamp on screen if you don't care about any of that, I will try to keep it brief, this is just because I know some people haven't played this game or even thought about it in like two years. This game is all about the Hackett family and the lands they own which include Hackett's quarry, the quarry, the one that's in the title of the game. The Hackett family are one of those Tennessee Williams southern gothic style families who seem to be in constant and perpetual financial decline, but still have enough money to have a giant mansion with electronic werewolf cages in it, because that's just how this kind of thing works. The Hackett's have a long and storied history of decline, and they've opened numerous business ventures in the area, including the Scrapyard and the Summer Camp, which they opened in the 1950s. The events of the game really start around six years prior, when a woman named Eliza Vorez enters the quarry or the areas around it I should say, with her travelling freak show Harem Scarum, chief exhibit of which is her own son Silas the Wolf Boy, a young albino boy who is also a werewolf. For the sake of this video, we're going to be ignoring the fact that every single character in media ever who is afflicted with albinism is evil, and every single Romani or even Romani coded person is a fortune telling witch, because I do not have time to go into any of that. I do recommend however you do your own reading and try to understand why that might be seen as somewhat problematic or offensive by some people. For the most part I do try to give Supermassive the benefit of the doubt, but as was pointed out in my Until Dawn video, they don't have the best representation. They do try, but it's not always the best. Anyway, moving swiftly on, so they've got this wolf boy in a cage, and the Hackett family children, Caleb and Kaylee, decide that keeping a child in a cage is wrong, because it is. So they try to free him, however this leads to them setting a fire that not only kills Eliza, but also leads to Silas buying Caleb, who in turn goes on to bite Kaylee and his father Chris, so now three of the Hackett family members are werewolves. 
So that sucks for them, but Chris still has rent to pay, so what are you gonna do? He has to keep his summer camp going, and six years later, in 2021, he hires nine camp counselors to help him with the Hackett's Quarry summer camp. Whilst all of this is going on, the non-werewolf Hackett family members have become werewolf hunters. They are trying to find and kill Silas because they believe that will fix their werewolf family members and make them normal again. Whilst the full moon is still up, one day before anyone's meant to arrive, two of the camp counselors, Laura and Mac, show up early. Despite the warnings of the local sheriff, they head into the quarry, which leads to Max becoming infected and turning into a werewolf. The two of them spend most of the game in captivity. The other seven counselors show up on time and have a pretty fun summer. In fact, it's arguably too fun because one of them, Jacob, doesn't want it to end and sabotages their ride home, hoping to spend more time with his summer fling, Emma. This means that they now have to spend the night under the full moon in the woods, and each of the characters is out there trying to survive against werewolves, werewolf hunters, and the ghost of Eliza. From here, it is the standard supermassive game fair. It's up to you to either keep these characters alive or see them die in horrible and traumatic ways. However, this game has the really fun added twist that all of these characters can become enemies, they can become werewolves, because after you're bitten, you start to transform very rapidly. This is really fun actually. If any of this sounds interesting, I recommend picking up the game because from this point onwards we'll be going into analysis and that will come with spoilers. I also recommend playing it multiplayer just so you can have a blast with friends. If any of it sounds fun, just do that and then come back. So now I want to talk about why this game is being compared to Until Dawn so much, where it does things better and where it falls apart. I've skipped straight to the quarry after Until Dawn instead of talking about any other Dark Pictures game because it is really the closest to it, even disregarding the fact that it was largely treated as Until Dawn 2 and that is what it begun development as. It's pretty similar, it has a nearly identical lodge complete with a final showdown that takes place in it for around half of the cast, it has a segment in the mines around the lodge, an ongoing narrative about tragedy haunting a family, and nine playable characters, eight main ones, and then one little extra one they throw in for spice. It's very similar. Another more fun and subtle similarity to Until Dawn is that both of them are very clearly made by people who just love horror, and they throw in all kinds of references. Some examples from this game is the title drop being nearly identical to Friday the 13th, the game is even about a vengeful mother haunting camp counselors around a lake, and her last name is Vorez, which sounds a lot like Voorhees. Another example is that Max gets a letter from Landis University, with John Landis being the director of An American Werewolf in London. That movie also does the cute little werewolf thing of having most of the soundtrack being moon-themed songs like Blue Moon and Moon Dance. The Quarry does similar stuff, it opens with Ariana Grande's Moonlight, and features a rendition of Fly Me to the Moon during the opening title crawl. In spite of all these similarities, the changes do make it an interesting experience. I think being denied the ability to reuse a lot of the mythology around Until Dawn, they've done something very cool with the werewolves and the kind of tragic southern gothic aesthetic. I think it does all work, and the werewolves do look really interesting. They're very humanoid, very long and gangly. They kind of look like Remus Lupin in the third Harry Potter movie. So they've made the best of a bad situation here. They've been left over with a bunch of just reused stuff from an Until Dawn prototype, and they seem to have made something interesting out of it at least. So. Before talking about the five main reasons I think it's worse, I do want to really quickly talk about some ways in which it's better, because I do like to stay positive. The first change is a really obvious one, it just looks better. Now, that's because it came out later on better hardware, but when you're making a game that is basically just an interactive movie, it helps if it looks good. Secondly, the scope of choices is bigger, what I mean by that is that very often in Until Dawn, a choice you made would be largely confined to the chapter it took part in, or would lead to dialogue later on. But the quarry reuses areas frequently to a pretty good effect, and early choices have lasting ramifications. 
A really good example is that Abigail can force open the door in chapter one, which means later in the game it doesn't have a lock, which indirectly causes Dylan to either get infected or lose his hand. Now, that's not to say the game isn't full of inconsequential choices that go nowhere or very, very short term ones, but it does have a handful of very standout choices that feel very impactful because of the scope of them. They run over several chapters. Finally, this game does have a lot more character interaction. That's not to say that they get on better or have more dialogue. I don't think that's true. I think the characters in this game are far worse written than Until Dawn, but characters can make choices which spill out into other characters' storylines quite easily. Multiplayer is pretty fun because there's a lot of man, you just killed me moments, uh, especially if you're the person who has the honor of playing as Jacob in your group. You can just get shot unceremoniously by Ryan pretty early on, and that's fun. I also do want to say, if this game was just the first one, it was just Until Dawn, but with this level of graphical fidelity, it probably wouldn't do as well as if Until Dawn just released in 2015, because there wasn't the same hype for this kind of game. People still watched it. it, it's still a game that drew a lot of playthroughs, which has always been the bread and butter of this series. People like to watch people play it, but the hype just wasn't there as much. However, I am now out of positivity and I want to talk about why this game is worse than Until Dawn. I have five main reasons I've put together. I'm going to be going through them from least intrusive to most intrusive. And at the end of it all, it's going to be the characters. So similar to the Until Dawn video, I will be talking about each of them. The fifth and least intrusive issue is that the game is just way too dark, even with the brightness all the way up on Gen 8 consoles. I've compiled footage from both gens and it's nearly impossible to see stuff in a lot of the Gen 8 stuff. The game just looks really odd at some point. In Abigail's segment in the Storm Drain in Chapter 9, you really can't see anything, which is especially terrible because the literal only tarot card worth picking up in the entire game is in here. Which brings me to the next point. Nothing is worth picking up in this game. Between clues, evidence, and tarots, there are 72 collectibles in this game, and only one of them, the Hierophant card, is worth picking up or tells you anything new about the game. Unlike Until Dawn, where you can read up about Josh's condition, the history of Blackwood Mountain, you don't really get that. Most of the clues here are redundant, they tell you stuff you already know, or things characters will explicitly state, and a lot of the tarot cards just lead to pretty pointless sections. They're the same as the totems in Until Dawn, but they just have a far more obnoxious presentation. In fact, with the exception of the Hierophant, you are wasting your time if you bother to read the item descriptions when you pick up a tarot card, because Eliza will read it out to you in forced mandatory sections. Dr. Hill, in Until Dawn, her predecessor, if you will, gave you insight into the minds of the characters, he gave you foreshadowing for the rest of the game, Eliza will read item descriptions to you. So if you've taken the time to try and investigate or be inquisitive, you're just going to be told the same information twice. There's no point in doing it. She's very obnoxious. I really do not like her inclusion. She's just as bad if you don't pick up the tarot card. She will actively berate you for not sitting through the same dialogue over and over. I, oh, I hate this character. My third complaint is that these spaces in this game are too big, to the point where it's almost immersion breaking. The characters just wander around these giant empty spaces, like Nick in chapter 2, or Dylan in chapter 9 when he goes to the scrapyard. There's just too much space for these slow characters, and it's not like they're even talking most of the time when they're in them. The characters just slowly make their way across them. It's not like Mike and Jess going to the cabin in Until Dawn, where their dialogue is admittedly cringy, but at least they're saying something. This issue is exacerbated by the series-wide issue that as soon as you are able to control your character's movement, all of the tension is gone. You are just in an empty space with all the time in the world to do whatever you want. David Cage, of all people, solved this way back in 2005 by adding time-sensitive puzzles to complete in Fahrenheit. Like, uh, if that guy can do it, anyone can. 
It's already been confirmed that they're working on a Dead by Daylight tie-in game, and if they don't add any kind of tension to these scenes in that, it will be a massive shame, even if it's just fixing generators in a set amount of time. This is so bad in the Hackett house, all of the tension is just gone as soon as you can control the characters, both Ryan and Laura. So chapter 9 is just a bust for that. The IGN guide even claims that you have limited time in a room when you're playing as Ryan, but I stood there for 10 minutes and nothing killed me. I was actively waiting for it. IGN guides, I know, like, it's a bit of a meme, but I was so desperate for any kind of tension in these segments that I was actively looking it up and trying to seek it out. Laura is the undisputed queen of these awful sections. Not only can she try and play piano when trying to hide from people who want her dead, she also has the worst section for it in the police station where she routinely complains about how she's losing blood and can't stay conscious for long, but you have as much time as you want here. And it's not really like she needs all of that time. The player can choose to just skip the section by going to bed, so how hard would it be to just have her collapse and add one line of dialogue? Because it plays out the same even if you just go to bed. This ties into the second worst issue, which is the game's utterly terrible pacing. Some segments are just nothing. At the start of chapter 7, you play as Ryan for about 30 seconds. In chapter 9, if Abigail's alive, you get to play as her for exactly one dialogue choice. It takes about 20 seconds and then it loads another character. It feels like filler that's added just to go, oh yeah, that character, you know? And there's all these awkward pauses. I don't get what that is. It feels like some kind of MCU thing where they're giving space for streamers or Let's Players to give little quips. It's weird. It just creates this dead air if you're playing it on your own. When you get back home, school or? Uh. Jerry's out. Understood. This is all over the game. It's not really major, but it, it does add up. I know that they're going for a kind of naturalistic dialogue, but it can be excessive. And then, to get to my final point, the biggest issue is the characters. I do hate to be negative, as I've said, but Until Dawn succeeded because it had a good chemistry between its cast, every character was likeable, they could have been someone's favourite, I had so many comments from people who liked the ones I didn't like, and it makes complete sense, the narrative is very focused, so all of them have a part to play, albeit some do have more to do than others, but more so than any other game in the catalogue, I think the quarry has not created every character equal. In fact, these characters seem to be fighting for the spotlight at points, they tread on each other's toes narratively, and also all of them have problems. The biggest consistent one is that with the exception of one character, everyone is cracking jokes all the time. No one seems scared or worried about the very deadly situation they're in. It's kind of jarring. In order to build back up to positive comments, I'm going to discuss every single character from worst to best rather than order of appearance, and for each character I'm going to be asking three questions. First one, why are they a camp counsellor? It might seem redundant, but it sets the tone for the character and determines their entire reasoning for showing up in the setting. The next question is, what is the point of this character? Why are they in the game? What do they represent? And could another character do their job better? This game is absolutely clogged with filler and overlapping storylines, so anything that could be cut probably should have been. And the third question, for a bit of fun, is are they worth playing? This question assumes you are playing the game with eight friends and you can only pick one character. Should you even bother picking up the controller, or should you just drink beers all night and pay no attention to the game? So, with all of that established, let's go to the worst character in the game. She seems so desperate. Poor, pathetic little Abby, ready to throw herself at the first guy that came along. Easy pickings. And you guys better be careful around here, you know, guys like you, easy pickings. On the official website for the quarry, it says that Nick's fatal flaw is an unwillingness to drop his stoic guard and let people in, and people means you, the player. There's about two traits to this guy, if that. He sucks. So Nick starts off as a bland tutorial character who feels like he was added because they needed eight characters, 
but then he morphs into a uncomfortable and what I assume is accidental domestic abuse metaphor. That sounds like a reach, right? But we'll get there. So why is Nick here? Why has he come all the way from Australia to Hackett's Quarry summer camp? He used to like camping with his dad, and he's the chef, so maybe he's into cooking. That's it. That's, that's all we know about him. We don't really get to know much about him because Nick is a designated tutorial guy. You basically get to do the shooting tutorial as him, the don't move tutorial as him, and then he turns into a werewolf. No matter what you do, he is the guy who turns into a werewolf first, and he wolfs out and vanishes for most of the game, only reappearing to kill Jacob during the best puzzle in the game. He's really more of a plot device for Abigail, if I had to explain his role in the game, but that in and of itself is a problem. Because Nick's story with Abigail is the classic nice guy, boyfriend, situationship, whatever, turns into a werewolf and is evil, but this game already has that plotline with Max, and it can also play out with Jacob, so why do we need to see it with Nick? He's the third guy to do this. This plotline isn't just done to death full stop, it's done to death within this game. But there's issues with Nick, because if you look at his dialogue when he's turning into a werewolf, nobody else does that. Nobody else is as much of an ass as he is, which kind of gives the impression that he's just a bad person. His closest parallel is Max, a guy who also has to turn into a werewolf, but when he's transforming, he's being comforting towards his girlfriend, Laura. He's also just trying to rationalize what's happening to him. Other characters like Dylan can even be straight up heroic, even knowing they're transforming into a werewolf. He will try and save Caitlyn by sending her away from him. So Nick turning into this strange incel out of nowhere is really jarring, very out of left field, and just gives the impression that he's always been like that, but he was just very good at masking it before. The character who's closest to this really is Jacob, who is very self-critical when he turns, but that's an important distinction. He's self-critical, and everything he says we know to be true. He does have those insecurities, so does Nick actually believe the stuff he's saying? Contrary to what my comment sections would have you believe, I do not think every character I dislike is problematic and ontologically evil, but I do have issues with Nick. He starts to display deep possessiveness for Abigail and very uncomfortable amount very early into his transformation, at a time where most other characters have full control of their faculties. There is overwhelming proof throughout the game that a character's deepest desires and thoughts are brought to the surface during a transformation. And there is evidence that Nick has just always been like this, even prior to his bite, he's just a bit more good at keeping up the e-boy facade. He competes with Jacob in displays of masculinity for whatever. He even makes out with Jacob's fling in front of everyone, which was her idea, but he's very complicit in it, and even when he goes to apologize to Abby, he's not massively sincere. He tries to engage with Abby about her hobbies, but the only way he can do it is with a sex joke. So, um, I heard this joke about artists. It's pretty bad. Oh yeah? Yeah. You wanna hear it? Sure. Okay. Here it is. Why couldn't the world's fastest painter ever keep a girlfriend? Hmm, why not? Because he always finished in one stroke. It's None of this is bad in isolation. I think making jokes with someone you care about, about their hobbies, isn't a bad thing. I don't think that going for a shootout with your bros makes you an awful person. I think Nick could genuinely just be a cool guy who didn't know what was happening to him so embraced it a bit more or was a bit more defenseless to the werewolf curse because everyone else who gets bitten knows what's happening to them 
prior to any kind of transformation. So there is a benefit of the doubt here, and I don't think pre-bite Nick is horrible. I do think, however, when his mask slips, if we're going with this interpretation, this can be viewed as a kind of foreshadowing. We're going to come back to this in Abby's section because I want to talk about how it affects her in that section there, but for the sake of Nick, all you need to know is that he starts off as a kind of bland soft boy who turns into the worst guy ever for about five minutes and then vanishes. It's kind of like any given beam me up soft boy post on Instagram. He's that. And I would not want to play as him. If I only had one character and my friends or whoever I was playing with insulted me by giving me Nick, I'd probably leave or just like get really drunk and just stop paying attention because after the first two chapters, you can't even really play as him. So to go back to this totally new and original tier list format that I've just came up with, Nick is the very bottom of D tier. He's really bad. There's so many problems with him, but I also don't think they could take him out of the game because without him, Abby would have nothing to do. So maybe just take both of them out. But then that just gets into a whole cascade of if you remove Abby, Emma has so much less to do. He's in such a frustrating place. And to top literally everything else off, Nick has one possible death. One. In a game all about choices and having all these different ways character stories can go, Nick will always have the same ending, or one of two based on a binary choice. And Nick's one singular death is something you can only have happen through inaction. The only way that Nick survives is if you say to someone, oh, maybe don't shoot that caged werewolf. It's nothing. It's just nothing. Next character. Right here in the podcast, man. If Josh was everything that was new, interesting, and subversive about Until Dawn in one character, Ryan is everything that's wrong about the quarry in one character. I hesitate to put him below Nick because I just don't like Nick, but if we're going purely objectively, Ryan is probably the worst. Now that's going to be a controversial opinion because for the first half of the game, Ryan is the best character, undoubtedly. He has the most to do. He has the most character, the most ties to the ongoing mystery. He's kind of the main character of the game, but halfway through, they seem to forget that, and he is affected more so than any other character by what appears to be rushed finales or dropped plot lines, or the fact that other characters can just enter someone else's plot line and completely derail it. Ryan becomes such a shadow of his former self around seven chapters in that it's hard to even think that he's the same character. Ryan starts unbelievably strong, he's easily very likeable, and he has so many traits and determined dynamics within the cast that I think he might have been the best character Supermassive had written for the first half of this game. He has so many fun sections, he's the most playable character in the game, and his choices always feel interesting. As mentioned briefly earlier, you can just shoot Jacob, and he doesn't even notice. Like, it's played off as a minor choice. He also has the option to remove Dylan's arm. You have loads of fun little dialogue options, which can lead to romantic interactions with both Dylan and Caitlyn, so he can really go whatever route the player wants on that. And he has an established relationship with the Hackett family. He's the only character we know concretely was previously a counselor in years prior, Clues show that he's close with the children Caleb and Kaylee, and we learn from dialogue that he's on first name basis with Chris Hackett, the guy who owns the summer camp. In fact, he views him as something of a father figure. Ryan came to the quarry after going through some rough stuff in his home life, and he's almost a part of the Hacketts. He's intimately familiar with the campgrounds, he's close with at least three family members, and when the group have to stay due to Jacob sabotaging the car, Ryan is the person Chris trusts to keep the group safe and inside. He almost confesses to him. He doesn't tell him about werewolves or whatever, but he has enough faith in him to do the right thing. Ryan also just has loads of fun little quirks. He's into supernatural stuff, but he's a skeptic. He likes podcasts. He takes interest in other characters' hobbies. He even asks Dylan to teach him about radio equipment at one point. So why is he so low on the list? Well, to understand this, we need to talk about the game's central theme, which is family. More so than anything else, the quarry is about family, and how far people will go to keep their families and loved ones safe. 
This is explored through Eliza and Silas, and also the Hackett's. They're contrasting forces, but they're both families. The Hackett family are a troubled group of people who do do some awful things, but they love each other. Wolves in general are associated heavily with narratives about family, be it through werewolves or even just symbolic wolves like the Starks in the Song of Ice and Fire. Wolves are gregarious pack animals with strong familial bonds. They're intrinsically linked to themes of familial love and loyalty to the pack. And nowhere do we see this more than through Travis Hackett, the game's real best character and most marked improvement from his Until Dawn counterpart, The Stranger. Travis is a uniquely multifaceted character. He gets berated by his mother, he's mistrusted by his family, and he's overall a loose cannon, but he will always go out of his way to defend or honor his family in spite of however they treat him. He shoots his brother in defense of Max, who's a total stranger, showing that he's not always just going to let them do whatever they want, but he's also more than happy to end the curse on them even after all of them are dead, causing great personal risk to himself for a group of dead people purely out of love and loyalty. Travis and Ryan are so similar in so many ways, they're both people who struggle to express complex emotions and will often make drastic decisions for the sake of a wider group without really consulting anyone. They both have close ties to the Hackett's. Travis is the black sheep of the family and Ryan's someone they've brought in with open arms, he's almost adopted in. So the fact that the two almost never interact in any meaningful way is terrible. Ryan spends the entire game defending the Hackett's, especially Chris, defending him against allegations made by Dylan as early as chapter 3. He's the same as Travis, they will both be guarded and kind of cagey, but will come to the defense of the Hackett's. But the game doesn't seem to notice this, because Ryan just stops caring about the Hackett's halfway through the game. The character assassination of Ryan begins when Kaylee Hackett dies. This is a girl who is kind of like a sister to him. He's even in a picture with her and her brother that's hanging in her father's office. That's how close they are. He speaks very highly of her in the early game, but he doesn't really care that she's dead. This guy's first reaction to seeing his father figure's daughter dead in a pool after being shot by a stranger is to go, man, how am I going to explain this to my boss? And then Nick starts trying to get freaky in front of the body, and he doesn't even really say anything or try to stop him, he just lets him do that? You'd be pissed off! Then Laura shows up and says, hey, I killed that girl you care about, and I'm trying to kill Chris, your father figure. And Ryan is initially like, maybe don't do that but caitlin just says chill out ryan you're being too much of a character right now so he immediately drops the issue and then agrees to help her she just killed this girl he should hate her but after this is where ryan just becomes incomprehensibly stupid instead of hating Laura or even mildly disliking her, he starts flirting with her and he says this line of dialogue, oh well what if there's another way, and Laura says nah there isn't, trust me. That will be important in a second. So after this, he's just besties with Laura and they go to the Hackett family house and can just start massacring them. He has nothing to say about this, even though he has a lot of loyalty to this family. In fact, Ryan can go as far as killing Chris Hackett here, his father figure. But if he does it, he has no lines of dialogue about it. He doesn't really care that he's just done that. And then they find out that that doesn't even do anything, because as Travis points out, there's other werewolves who you'd need to kill. So Laura has just convinced him to kill his father figure, not at all understanding the situation, completely incorrect about everything she's said, and he says nothing. In fact, he spends the remainder of the game, if he survives up until this point, just being a quippy joke machine. What happened here? So, in spite of a strong intro and being the character who most closely parallels the game's themes, he really has nothing to do with the plot when it really comes down to it. He just becomes a background character. He's a really clear example of why this game just has too much. Too much intersecting plot that treads on each other's toes and lots of stuff just gets lost in that stampede. I legitimately believe if we had a game where we only played as Ryan, but he kept his chapters 1 through 5 characterization, and the gameplay was maybe spiced up a little, it would be a better game, because he's the most interesting character conceptually. He could join with the Hackett's and be an enemy to Laura, or join with Laura in an attempt to help the Hackett's, looking for another way to cure everyone's werewolf disease. He could even team up with Eliza 
and Silas may be seeing something of Silas in himself. They're both tormented boys who went through a rough home life. Granted, he was never put in a cage as far as we know, but still. Taking notes for the first playthrough I completed when making this video, I got legitimately angry writing notes about Ryan because he's everything that's wrong with the game. Dropped plot lines, characters that seem to flip-flop motivations, characters not showing any kind of interest or investment or fear in the situations they're in. On top of that, his gameplay starts really strong but gets really stale. He's part of that issue in the Hackett house where all of the tension drops off. So whilst I would say yeah I'd play Ryan if I was offered him at the 8 player wolf pack, I really would just get frustrated playing him past chapter 6. As I said, if you made a game about a boy who was torn between a family of werewolves and a werewolf hunter and he has to kind of pick a loyalty between it, it would be awesome. They should have just made that. Next character. Okay. Here's a riddle for you. What's got two thumbs and is suddenly riding solo on a freaky island in the dark? This fool, well, one thumb, one available thumb. Emma's name Mountbank means someone who deceives. It ties into the fact that she's an actor, she teaches acting at the camp, but she's nowhere near two-faced or duplicitous enough. This game really needs a mean girl and she just isn't doing it. To tie back into my central thesis of this video, the characters are the issue here, and Emma is such a good example because she spends so much of the game alone or with Jacob developing that subplot. I want to see her interacting with other people and causing problems for them. I want her to cause issues for Abby, I want her to cause issues for Caitlin, I want her to cause issues for Dylan and Ryan, because I want Regina George, and she is not Regina George. Emma comes very close to reaching the heights of Until Dawn's amazing mean girl duo, Jess and Emily, when she makes out with Nick at the campfire, which is what causes him to run out into the woods and get bitten by a werewolf. She sets the game into motion, and this would fix so many of the game's pacing issues if she just hung around and kept being problematic and causing problems for people, because the game would go so much quicker with someone like Emily or Jess from Until Dawn, who causes problems for the group, which mean that the game progresses and we don't just stagnate on these long chapters where nothing happens. Emma is very much the largest victim of this game's obsession with splitting focus. Whilst Ryan fell off towards the end, it feels like Emma can never really get started. Most of the characters in this game, due to the fact that it needs to split focus between so many plot lines, can only be one thing. And instead of being mean girl who causes plot to happen, Emma is very much Jacob's ex-girlfriend. Very early on, we are basically shown by the game that that's all she's going to be. I have very few negative notes about Emma and Jacob's relationship, I think it's actually a good thing. A lot of the time it's what causes the game to move along because Jacob is such a dynamic character. So really no notes there, and it's also really realistic and well written. Jacob has very obvious abandonment issues so does not want to see this thing come to an end, and Emma has very complex feelings about it. She likes him, she has feelings for him, she can even be seen to lead him on a bit, but at the same time she is putting her foot down, she says routinely throughout the game that she does not want things to continue beyond the summer, so it's well written, it's realistic, it's how teenage relationships are. Their meeting at the end of the game where he can confess to what he's done and she can finally fully break things off with him shows a lot of character development for both of them and it feels very cathartic, it's probably the best scene in the game, however most players won't see it because one of these two will be dead. And by one of these two, I mean Jacob. We'll cover it in his section, but that guy dies everywhere, and it's awesome. I think it's awesome that you can miss out on such an impactful scene. It really goes to show that relationships don't always end with catharsis. I think that's good writing as well. So, I like everything about this part of Emma. I just wish that they did more with her, because she spends so much of the game alone. Her best gameplay segment is her entirely alone on an island. It's a fun segment. But she doesn't interact with anyone, she has such a minimal impact on the overall plot. A good example of how redundant she feels is that she can take a picture of the werewolf. In any other story, this would be how she reveals the threat of what is coming for the group. But Laura has already met everyone and explained the entire plot, so her taking the photo does absolutely nothing. Emma is fine, she's written fine. 
I don't really see why she'd even come to the camp to answer the first question I have about all the characters because Abby comments how she seems to bully the kids she looks after, she doesn't really seem to like them, and she doesn't really seem to have any real reason to be here, but she is here and she's fine. I wish that they just gave her more to do and didn't constantly seem to sideline her or put her on her own when she should be the one who is driving the plot. I also think the kind of content she makes is very strange. She just looks at the camera and talks about issues in her personal life, like drama in her friendship group. I get that drama channels are kind of big, but they're usually talking about famous people or influencers or, or kind of niche internet celebrities. If there was a drama channel that just talked about like a random group of friends somewhere in America every week, I would be so confused. I, I don't think it would be that good but feel free to tell me if you'd watch that because I, I would i maybe check it out if i was playing wolfpack i'd be completely fine with getting emma i wouldn't be massively over the moon about it that's a werewolf joke but i'd be happy to have that one segment where she has to escape from the werewolf on the zip line that's fun that's a fun segment c for could have been better tier on to the next character Listen, there could be another way. Have you thought about that? I've spent the last month thinking about nothing else. Stop the cap! <laughs> Stop the cap right now! <laughs> Laura's a pretty great character, but I think whoever wrote them didn't know that there were other characters in this game. I don't take any issue with Laura because of who she is or what her plot is meant to be. She's clearly here for the fact that she loves nature and the fact that she cares about getting academic credits. And Max is clearly here because he likes being around Laura. Their dialogue is completely fine. I think Laura is even quite charming in several of her sections. The main issue is that she vanishes for half of the game and then shows up and completely eclipses everyone else. Save for the prologue, Laura has no involvement in the game prior to chapter 7, but as soon as she shows up, the entire plot seems to bend to be around her. It seems like they finally decided on the plot they want to go with, but it means everything that she wasn't involved in seems kind of redundant and silly, and every character who comes into her orbit just kind of becomes a sidekick to her. This is especially apparent with Ryan, as we've already discussed. Unfortunately, Laura does not have enough depth to carry the plot. She is a character who is very one note in her aims and seems to be very utilitarian in just doing whatever the plot needs her to do. She never grapples with the fact that she's trying to kill an entire family of people just on the off chance it might help her out personally when she finds out she killed a literal child on accident and completely pointlessly she has almost nothing to say about it. She really struggles with the fact that the game has a very rushed conclusion. Laura has almost nothing to do with the main group, she's even depicted separately to them on the cover as though her plotline is just a different game altogether, so now we need to judge her on the merits of how well she fits into that plotline. It's already been established that she cheapens everything to do with the other characters, but if we're taking her at face value and looking at what Laura's story is about, is it any good? No, not really. Laura's plotline is all about her building up to killing enough werewolves until her problem's solved. She's kind of this Alison Argent, if you know you know, kind of badass werewolf hunter girl. But the main werewolf she has to kill is Silas, and that sucks because Silas is a terrible villain. Up until its finale, Until Dawn only had one creature you had to fight, and that was Hannah. So it already had some plot relevance, most of the characters had a connection to them, there was something there. This game would be a lot better if Chris Hackett was just the main villain, or even Caleb Hackett, and it was all about Ryan needing to find a better solution whilst Laura wants to hunt them. Unfortunately, the main werewolf, the alpha wolf, if you like, is Silas, a character who has absolutely no presence, and in his final appearance, People are talking about trying to find him, like it's going to be difficult, and he just runs into their car and gets run over. It's such a rushed conclusion. I have no clue how they got away with this, how this got put in the game. Like, if in any other series, the main villain, people were hyping them up the whole time, and you just don't see them at all, and then they just run in front of a car and die? What? Immediately prior to this, Travis says that his family have been hunting Silas every full moon for six years. That's 72 full moons. He's been on 72 werewolf hunts. 
and on the 72nd try, Laura shows up and the wolf that he's looking for just throws itself in front of his car. Huh? This wouldn't be so terrible if there weren't so many examples of the game just letting Laura do whatever she wants. The biggest example outside of this is the one we've already spoke about several times, which is her killing a child and everyone who knew that child is just cool with it. Like that's, that's suspending disbelief a bit too hard for me. But this Silas scene gets even worse because Laura can choose to spare him and instead shoot Travis? Why would she do that? I get that Travis has been kind of mean to her throughout the game, but Laura has no issues with killing werewolves. She can kill Nick, she can kill Kaylee. These are two people who had no involvement in what happened to Max or her, but she doesn't care. She has nothing to say about it. So why does she suddenly develop a conscience for Silas purely because she ran him over? That's so out of character. It doesn't make any sense. All of this compared with her really boring, tension-killing, immersion-breaking gameplay moments, you'd think she was my least favourite character. And that's kind of true. She's in a similar camp to Ryan, where I feel like if the game was entirely about her and they just shifted focus, instead of having all these disparate plot points that don't go anywhere, it would be way better, and I'd like to see a game entirely about this kind of thing. It's kind of like the Star Wars prequels, I like the vibe of it better than the execution. I think in my head there's a better story than the one I'm actually presented with. However, Laura is better than Ryan because she's the person who has all the conversations with Travis, and Travis, as we've said, is the best character in the game. I'm not going to reiterate all of those points, but you know that he's a well-realized character, he has a lot of potential reasons for doing everything he does, and he's consistently written. She's also the only character to interact with the human form of Max, and he's a great character. Their dialogue feels very natural, and I get that most of the dialogue in the game is meant to feel natural, but theirs has the most easy chemistry. Max is really easy to like, not just because he has very good dialogue and he seems to consistently be a pretty swell guy, but he's also in the same game as Nick, another kind of loser who's content to just drift through life, largely defined by the woman they interact with. However, when Nick randomly turns into a horrible person, Max is pretty consistently cool, so he has a direct point of comparison within his own piece of art to make him look better. So whilst Laura is a good example of the issues of this game, be it with the various ongoing plotlines being dropped and the fact that everything feels very rushed, it's easier to like her than it is, say, Ryan, because she is elevated by her interactions with superior characters. If you pick Laura for your Wolfpack session, then be prepared to be the one who goes and gets everyone else's food order, because after the prologue you don't have anything to do for a few hours. However, once you do start having stuff to do, you're going to be the main character. C tier, let's move on. So is it just me? Is it kind of hot when she gets all bossy like that? I'm always hot, pencil dick. Yeah, okay, thank you, bye, bye. Caitlin, who is played by London Tipton herself, Brenda Song, is an interesting character who suffers from being underdeveloped, just like pretty much every other character in the game. She's at the quarry as an activities coordinator, showing that she's well organized and put together, and she's also shown to be someone who can take initiative when she takes up the duties of the missing camp counselors. We learn early on that she's a childhood friend of Jacob, however the two of them get almost no screen time together first the first two chapters, and the game fumbles their friendship, which is another L for mixed gender platonic rep. However, she is good friends with Dylan, who she set up as a romantic rival to, so that's some interesting characterization. The official website describes her as the group's wildcard, which I think is evidence that the devs didn't really get the character they wrote here, because Caitlyn isn't a wildcard. She pushes the plot forward, sure, but most of that stems from the fact that she's a natural leader. She's a lot like Ryan in many respects. A lot of the things that she says are just plans or one-liners. So she's not a wildcard for suggesting plans, it's completely in her character, and most of them make complete sense. They're not crazy schemes. If you were going to call any character in this group a wildcard, it would be Jacob. He's a guy who blows up a car, potentially, in chapter one just to try and get laid. That's wildcard behavior. That's what Charlie Kelly was talking about that one episode. I'm still the wildcard, no, 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 so no. that's good. No, no, no. Guys, we're forsaking the group dynamic, okay? Oh. And truthfully, Charlie, come on. I mean, nobody wants a wild card, okay? It doesn't make any sense. We don't want a maniac in our group, but there's no benefit to it. Mm -hmm. Then they go two for two on not really understanding Caitlyn because her achievement, if only she survives the night, is called the final girl. That should really just be an achievement for keeping any of the girls alive. I don't think any of them inhabit this trope any more than each other. I'd say Abigail is maybe the closest in terms of the traditional 80s trope, but even then it's, it's a stretch. What makes Caitlyn the first really good 
character on this list isn't that she's a wild card or that she's a traditional final girl, it's that she's just very competent. Everything she says makes complete sense, she's able to keep herself alive in very dangerous situations, her final shootout at the end is epic but it's not a skill she gets out of nowhere, we're shown as early as the tutorials in chapter 2 that she's good at shooting. Everything she's good at, she is consistently good at, she is a consistent character. But because she isn't Laura, the game isn't really about her by the time she finally gets her scenes where she can shine and that kind of takes a lot of the punch away from them. On top of this, we have to judge her by the merits of what few character traits she is given because most of the characters in this game are lacking. And sadly, the game dedicates a lot of time to her romantic attraction towards Ryan. But she's a rival to Dylan, someone Ryan has way more scenes with, and admittedly, better chemistry with. So Caitlyn kind of feels like a compulsory hetero option that they just kind of threw in. And that's pretty much all she is. She does not get anywhere near as much time with Ryan as Dylan does. I do like how close Dylan and Caitlyn are. They're not jealous, they're not petty rivals, they seem to be quite good friends. Most of Caitlyn's shootout against the werewolf towards the end of the game is spent protecting Dylan, and when he transforms into a werewolf, he will send her away trying to protect her. They're not jealous of each other, they don't fight and bicker, they're just good friends who happen to like the same person, and that's cool. Caitlyn is probably more so than any other character constantly undermined by the overlapping roles of each of the characters. Ryan beats her as a leader, Dylan beats her as a love interest, Emma beats her as an object of Jacob's affection, someone he spends time with. I get they're just friends, but it would be nice to see them interact more. Laura beats her as a badass who kills werewolves. So what is Caitlyn? Caitlyn is both competent and consistent, but she suffers from a lack of things to do, she suffers from a lack of content, and by the time she's finally given things to do, she's being largely overshadowed. All of that said, I do think she's a good character, she has interesting traits, and it's fun to play as her, I'd very happily pick her up in a Wolfpack game. B for better than the ones that have came before, but not quite as good as the best three. <laughs> Dylan can crush a werewolf with a car in a scrapyard. He's also the only character who uses his actual job, being the camp's radio guy, to any kind of effect in the game when he scares the werewolves off using the high-pitched dog whistle. For those two reasons alone, he's top three, but he's also just pretty fun. In a game where almost every character dips in and out of just being a complete goofball and kind of ignoring the plot, Dylan's the only character I could really believe doing that. We've seen several times that he uses this kind of behaviour to cope with stressful situations, and he goes through some of the most stressful situations in the game. I like how he can lose his arm. That sounds really, like, awful when I say it, but what I mean is often in these games the penalty for messing something up is death. Dylan can be permanently scarred, which some argue is potentially worse or more affecting, because he's not just dead, he's someone who has to live with permanent injuries because of the choices made. If he loses his arm, Caitlyn gives him painkillers, which is also a fun headcanon as to why he's so wacky and kind of out of it for pretty much all of the game. No other character has an in-universe explanation for why they seemingly dip in and out of how much they care about the life or death situation they're in. Dylan also has this uncanny ability to just follow around whoever's got the most interesting plot at that time. He follows Ryan around when Ryan's still an interesting character, and the two have genuinely sweet interactions. It's way easier to ship them than it is to imagine Ryan being with Caitlyn, purely by virtue of Dylan having way more screen time, and their kiss at the fireplace is sweet. I think Dylan's face is pretty good here. Dylan is a character who has some really funny faces throughout the game. I mean, like, look at this screenshot. But then when Ryan gets sucked into Laura's orbit and just stops being a character altogether, he gravitates over to Caitlyn, and this is the part of the game where she's getting given all the cool set pieces. So Dylan's just a mainstay of the fun parts of the game, and as a result of that, it's always a joy to play him. On top of that, he has some genuinely witty dialogue, and beyond that, he's just a compelling character. He has an interest in radios and is kind of an artsy type, but we also learn he's really into maths, and he's very academic so he's kind of a best of both worlds character. Similarly to Caitlyn, I actually don't have that much to say about Dylan. He doesn't reinvent the wheel, but he's not really a bad character. 
he's better than most of the others in fact he's consistent and because of the way he's written most of the issues that i have with the game just don't apply to him it's not really that he fixes the issues it's more that he sidesteps them so yeah, Dylan's pretty good, he's top 3, he's our first A tier character, and if I was asked to play him in Wolfpack, I'd have a pretty fun time. It's not really so much that he has loads of really amazing sections, but the few set pieces he does have are fun, he has some fun dialogue, and he's generally just enjoyable. Like a supply cache for rangers or whatever if they're out in the woods. Naked rangers? <laughs> so it would seem. <laughs> it makes complete sense for Abigail to work at this camp. She clearly loves art and has a passion not just for doing it, but also for teaching it and imparting that joy onto others. She's also good with kids, as evidenced when she remembers which child the doll belongs to should you break into the cabin. Her last name literally means shy in Swedish, and her story is largely about her overcoming her introverted nature and learning to be a more proactive person. So a big issue with this game is that there's too many storylines, I've said this over and over, but I would not want to cut Abigail's. I think it is a stroke of genius, although I am somewhat sure that it's accidental because it's handled with far more tact and subtlety than pretty much anything else in the game. In order to illustrate this point, let's just go through it, focusing in on her two main relationships with both Emma and Nick. We're introduced to Abby as a shy girl who's interested in arts, who has an unlikely friendship with Emma and a crush on Nick. She sees Emma as this kind of big sister figure, she asks her for advice on all kinds of things because Emma naturally seems to have more life experience, and she has quite a sweet rapport with Nick. However, neither of these relationships are entirely reciprocal. We learn early on when Jacob is talking about collecting everyone's bags that Emma is more than willing to speak for Abby, and we learn from Nick through his werewolf monologues that he doesn't really care that much about Abby, she's easy pickings. If we are going with the Nick's werewolf comments are his true self or what he truly believes, then Abby actually sees through him very early on. The first time she meets him, she surmises that he's just a dick. However, she eventually warms up to him, buying more so into the facade he puts up. But here she's being actively manipulated, she's buying into a false front that Nick is going out of his way to curate. It's not like they're just bumping into each other, he's coming to visit her at the art cabin, which she remarks early on is all the way out of the way, he's travelling across the camp to try and make these moves. And as he says later in his werewolf speech, it's because he believes that she is easy pickings, she's easy to get with, and then he can just discard her. Nick's overall disinterest in Abby is shown throughout the game when he's unable to take her passion seriously, or when he makes out with Emma right in front of her as part of a power play against Jacob, putting himself and his pride above anything she cares about. After this, Nick is bitten by a werewolf when he goes to consult Abby. This is interesting because it's him actively predating on her which leads to him literally metamorphosizing into a predator. Abby cannot save him here, no matter what she does. This might be because he was just always predatory, although it's more than likely because this game is bad. Nick's possessiveness and entitlement towards Abby's body just gets worse and worse until eventually he tries to make advances on her in front of the corpse of a child? This scene is so disturbing, it's just so wrong, but Abby's the only person here who really has a reaction to it, because Ryan's not a character anymore. Abby is the exception to the rule in characters in this game, all just being jokesters all the time. She has appropriate responses, she seems scared, she seems frightened, and this is not to say someone can remain stoic in difficult times, but she's the only one I really believe understands the gravity of the situation. Her reaction following these events, when she pushes Nick in the pool and he begins having a reaction, is also realistic. People who have strong feelings don't just lose them, even if the other person is becoming worse. She still shows concern for him, even though she's probably got a bit of an ick, and she's still actively trying to help him, in spite of him really going mask off bad guy at this point. This all culminates when Nick physically attacks Abby, he picks her up and throws her against a wall, and it's here she has to choose if she wants to literally pull the trigger on this relationship. Ending the relationship symbolically, she can shoot Nick, and if she doesn't, she can die. This is a pretty powerful metaphor for just how dangerous these kinds of relationships can be, but again, I see no reason to believe this is intentional, because it's so out of whack with the rest of the game. 
And if Abby does pull the trigger and survive here, the game does not give her a trite abuse makes you stronger story, something that I absolutely hate. She is instead shown to be competent through traits she already had, and she still shows sympathy for Nick, in spite of everything that's happened. Her final contribution to the game, her finding the silver shells for Caitlyn, is achieved because of her observantness, something that she was already shown to have throughout the entire game. She's the person who can find the only good tarot card. So what we've got here is not the overdone shy girl gets abused by man and becomes girl boss story, it's instead shy girl was always capable and even though she's gone through some bad things, she can bounce back. It's a much more uplifting story in my eyes. It's also worth noting that the only other way Abby can die if she isn't killed by werewolf Nick is being killed by werewolf Emma, so her only two deaths can come at the hands of people she trusts. So even though Abby's plot is just another spaghetti noodle in the pile of stuff that has almost nothing to do with the main story or its main themes, I don't want this to not be in the game because I think it sends a really good message and it's better than most storylines that tackle this kind of subject matter. Again, very unsure if it's intentional, but if it was, well done to whoever wrote Abby's story. However, after all of this goes down with Nick, Abby has almost nothing to do, so I can't put her in S tier. She just runs out of things to do. She completely runs out of steam. Most of her dialogue options are just yes or no, and all of her sections after this are just single dialogue choices or walking around a big empty space and picking up a completely useless clue. There's not that much to her after this. They just don't care about her anymore. A is for Abby tier. I like her story conceptually, but her gameplay is very lacking, so yeah, I wouldn't be happy if she was the only character I could play in spite of how much I like her story. Boom! Oh! oh. There it is! Oh Ooh. man, good sight! Freak. We've known for years now that Jacob is just a great name for anyone in any piece of werewolf media, so it's really no surprise that Jacob in the quarry is based. He is the best character, and it's not even close. He's not the best character for any real standout reason, it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts of likability. Before even discussing his character, I have to say Zack Tinker is the single best mocap actor that this studio has ever gotten. He puts his whole body into everything he does, which means Jacob has all these fun mannerisms. He's always opening his arms when he's talking and kind of swaying about. It really lends itself to this kind of party guy personality he has. On top of this, Jacob does not have a single dull section. Almost all of his gameplay is amazing, he's constantly on the run or doing something. Every time we see him, the plot develops in some way. He's way too dynamic to be bogged down by all of this slow pacing that everyone else is up to. Whilst everyone else is just ambling about, having long, boring conversations, he's just running about in the woods chasing people or getting chased by people and falling into bear traps. It's insane, it's so good. Jacob can die in 6 out of 10 chapters, which is basically every chapter as soon as the main threat is established. This guy has actual stakes. Choices? In my choice game, it's more likely than you think. Jacob's time in the Hackett Werewolf Cage is the best part of the game in terms of choices and consequence. There's not just a binary press here to save character button, there's numerous ways you can go about it. You can free him, you can free the werewolf and get him killed. You can shoot the werewolf killing Nick, which basically prevents any damage happening to Jacob for the remainder of the game. You can leave him in the cage, but then later on in the game damage a fuse box, which causes the werewolf to get into his cage and kill him. There's so many outcomes here. It's... the whole game should just be this. On top of all of this, he has a really compelling character arc. He can either grow and develop as a person, or he can remain stagnant. And him remaining stagnant ties into him becoming a werewolf, so there's a lot to analyse here. No, summer's over. Summer's over. And you're nothing! She doesn't want you! Nobody does! Nobody wants you! One of the first things Jacob does in this game is look out over the scenery around Hackett's Quarry and say, man, why would anyone ever want to leave this place? 
Jacob wants to stay here, partly because he can just extend his fling with Emma, but also he enjoys this kind of thing. He's naturally outdoorsy, he's come to the camp to teach sports to kids, he's just an outdoorsman, he seems to care the least about his phone being taken. Whether Hackett's are defined by a desire to break a cycle, they want a curse to end, Jacob wants to keep the cycle going, he wants to stay in an infinite summer. Whilst the Hackett's are defined by familial connections and close bonds shared, Jacob is defined by his abandonment issues and the fact that he is willing to sabotage everything just to get closer to people. He is the opposite of them. He is a inversion. Jacob becoming a werewolf and attacking Emma can be seen as the logical end point of everything he wants. He is now bound to the moon in cycles. He is living the same thing over and over, which is what he wanted when he was wishing for just one more day at the camp, wishing to just infinitely extend his summer vacation. He also has complete control over her because he's going to eat her and she can't do anything about it. If Jacob has been carrying around Emma's bracelet the entire game at this point, she can actually defend herself with it and save her life. This can be viewed in one of two ways, it can be viewed as Jacob's connection to her, preventing him from killing her as a werewolf, that's the positive way to view it, but it can also be viewed as a visual metaphor for how this toxic relationship and pursuing it has damaged Jacob. He's really just overexerting himself for something that he should probably give up on. The two of them clearly aren't good for each other, Emma can see it, he just can't. Now, cannibalizing someone and being in a relationship with them are very different things, right? But symbolically, he's got what he wants here, because as Emma says herself, he only views her as a prize to be won, something to have as an achievement. He doesn't view her as a person, or at least he struggles to. I don't think he doesn't want to, but he struggles to. Because Jacob is a character defined by his ability to be a real man. We see this really early on when he makes fun of Nick for not making a move on Abby. I don't think he'd care if the girl he was with was Caitlyn or Emma or Abigail. He just wants someone to want him. Which is why when he hits his peak of despair during his solo werewolf transformation, his main grievance that comes to the surface is that nobody wants him. He feels unloved, he feels incredibly lonely and just wants any kind of connection viewing these people as a means to an end. So whilst any of Jacob's earlier deaths are also tragic, him becoming a werewolf is the ultimate bad end because it's kind of a monkey paw bargain. He has to spend the rest of his days in this place he likes, reliving things over and over, which is exactly what he wanted, but he's also become exactly what he views himself as, an unlovable monster. In my eyes, the good ending for Jacob is the one where he comes clean to Emma about sabotaging the car and the two agree to break things off permanently. This is saddening for him in the immediate moment, but is ultimately good for him in the long run because it shows a maturity on his part. He's willing to own up to things, he's willing to embrace abandonment, this thing that drives all of his fears, just because he knows it's the right thing to do, and because he's now understood that life goes on in spite of him losing this thing he cared about. Jacob is the only S tier character in the quarry. It's not to say he's not without flaws, I still think he can be a bit too over the top zany and silly in serious situations, and I still think his gameplay towards the end can be lacking. If you make certain choices, you miss out on a lot of these cathartic endings and just see Jacob running about in the woods by himself and then the game ends. So he's not without flaw, I'm not trying to say he's a perfectly written character, but he's just leagues above the rest of them here. His story can stand on its own two legs, but also ties into the central themes of the game without treading on the toes of other characters. His gameplay is pretty consistently fun, with actual choices and stakes involved in it. So yeah, he's just better than the other characters. Looking at the time, it's been over an hour, so if you've made it this far, congratulations. But now I'm just going to try and wrap up all of my thoughts into a more coherent conclusion. So, whilst I've tried to get increasingly more positive about the writing and characters here, and I did have fun with the game, it's hard not to see it as a pale imitator of what it was meant to be a successor to. It has its moments, and some of its highs even reach the same highs as Until Dawn, but its lows are far lower and far more consistent. Until Dawn was defined by a cast with a lot of chemistry and how interconnected the plot was, but the quarry feels like a cast that's in conflict with itself. This is evidenced the most by characters like Laura and Ryan, and even though I can enjoy these characters in isolation, it can't be something that's greater than the sum of its parts when its parts are just constantly infighting. 
And when you're not immersed in the characters, you start to pay more attention to other aspects of the game, and that really isn't good for this kind of game, because the gameplay most of the time is very shallow. There's no tension when you can move your characters, a lot of the choices really don't have that much of an impact. So, if you're not immersed in the story, what does this game offer you? Frankly, I think Supermassive needs to pick a side here. If they're going to be making interactive movies forever, they need to tighten up their scripts. They need to focus on what is and isn't relevant and write it like you would a tight screenplay. Or they could try and innovate in the area of gameplay, which I hope they will do with the upcoming Dead by Daylight tie-in game. In this game, I really hope that they can add more innovation in this area, less large open spaces and more condensed or claustrophobic areas with interactable puzzles in the vein of classic survival horror. Adding tension in these quiet, intimate moments would allow the cast more time to be proactive in their decisions, and they could really just benefit from a better defined scope and more clear objectives. This game is proof that bigger is not always better. Key story elements like the Hackett family just feel incomplete or not fleshed out or trod over by other story elements. In the quarry, you can wipe out an entire family, the family that the quarry is named after, and it changes almost nothing. They should hone in on what makes characters important, what the story is about, and benefit from a more defined game. Until Dawn was great, but not every game needs to be about eight characters surviving. Dead by Daylight is usually a game about four people surviving a single killer. Try and emulate that with a smaller, more intimate cast. Maybe it's a shorter game, but decisions matter more, and each character has more agency. Not every game needs to be Until Dawn, as much as I love that game. I think my main takeaway from playing this so many times is that the quarry had loads of good ideas, but the characters are not there. It feels like none of the ideas are fully fleshed out. I just really wish we had a game where half of this stuff was cut out and the other half was as good as it could be. Anyway, that's really all I have to say on the quarry. Uh, press all the buttons and I will see you next time. Have a good day.